Satish Yoga University. And I will be your moderator for today's webinar. Luckily, Yoga University, in association with CCRYM, welcomes you all to the second international webinar on preventive oncology and integrated approach. I request the participants to keep their microphones on mute, and in case anyone has a question, they can type it in the chat box, which will be answered by our speakers at the end of each session. I can mute your microphones. Today is day two of international webinar. For the first session, we have with us Dr. Vijay Kumar P.S., who will be talking about a very new, less expressed and less discussed, but upcoming and booming approach in the field of preventive oncology. His topic for today is preventive oncology in polyvagal perspective. Uh, before that, I would like to give a brief introduction about Dr. Vijay Kumar. Dr. Vijay Kumar is an associate professor at Lakulish Yoga University. He is also an Ayurveda and yoga therapy consultant. He has published more than 40 papers in the field of yoga, psychology, and medicine. He is a well-renowned clinician in the field of Ayurveda and yoga. He previously was the resident medical officer at Arogya Dhamma, a holistic hospital in Eswasa University, during which he worked and conducted several camps for the famous Stop Diabetes Movement, he was the head of neurology and rehabilitation department at Arogya Dhamma, as well as associate professor at Eswasa University. He has been trained and worked under Dr. Nagratna, Dr. H.R. Nagendra, and Raghuramji, all of whom he considers his guru. Now I request Dr. Vijay Kumar to start his session. Over to you, sir. Thank you very much. And uh, namaste, everybody. Uh, a very warm welcome, one and all. So thank you very much uh, for the organizing committee for giving me an opportunity to share, uh, you know, uh, my thought on this uh, very uh, you know, needy uh, content of this hour. So uh, without making any further delay, let me share this slide for this moment. Yeah. So... So my topic uh, for today's webinar is something uh, you know uh, different than regularly what we get to hear about uh, you know preventive oncology. So as we all know that, like from last couple of sessions, we have been hearing about uh, uh, cancer. As we all know that, right? That's a second uh, uh, you know major uh, uh, causative factor for uh, death, global death and uh, mortality. Uh, being a prostate cancer is the first amongst men and uh, breast cancer being the first amongst women. So as we know that the uh, financial, social, even uh, you know, personal caregiver burdens and an individual burdens, what an individual go through, especially during uh, uh, the course of the entire malignancy. So it's been, uh, uh, you know, uh, like a, a huge nagging problem for a medical uh, fraternity to find exact causative factors and how to deal uh, those factors because it remains still remains a challenge for medical fraternity to find out what are the actual causes causative factors how do an individual develops any kind of malignancies because we all know that malignancy is uh, any cell in the body that, that does not uh, want to die. It, the cell wants to multiply and grow and invade and it wants to spread across the human system and flourish. So if we try to understand the hallmarks, the very uh, evident uh, uh, you know, marks are the steps of uh, the entire cancer manifestation, generally few uh, basic 
uh, traits which exhibits during this course of disease. First thing is sustained proliferative signaling, like the entire uh, cell signaling, the information system inside the body gets uh, uh, screwed in, in a, a general term. The sustained uh, growth uh, stimulating factors go on rising. That gives false signaling to proliferate and grow further. And there are defense mechanisms in the body like immune system, and other uh, suppressor mechanism, tumor uh, necrosing factors and other suppressors are there in the body. They have to take care of something which is growing out of way. But the problem here is these uh, uh, cancer mechanism, these cells of cancerous, uh, cancerous cells, they take over, they invade these suppressors and resisting apoptosis. Apoptosis is program cell death. After a certain amount of time, every cell in the body has to die. That, that's how the entire human organism works, but as certain cases, uh, due to underlying uh, pathological influence, certain cells try to escape this apoptosis cycle, but this is a normal process. Unfortunately, our immune system uh, would be in a position where it fails to recognize this uh, missed uh, or resisted uh, cell, which does not want to get into apoptosis. So the second thing is enabling uh, replicative immortal cells because these cells are capable enough to uh, uh, reproduce and replicate themselves and travel across and produce new blood connections like new blood vessels and try to go, they go on you know, multiplying and growing. That is how the entire metastasis and growth happens. These are the basic set of cancer hallmarks we get to see in, uh, in the uh, case. What would be the, if we try to summarize the underlying causative factors, uh, causative factor melts down to a very narrow passage. Uh, rather, we could say we have very limited explanation to define the exact causative factors. The one such thing could be genetic change or instability. And second is immune inflammatory response, like uh, chronic low-grade inflammation. Generally, that gives rise to uh, tumor formation in the body. So these are the two uh, uh, crucial, rather we could call, crucial etiological factors that gives rise to the, far the formation of uh, you know, malignant. What would be the biological factors uh, generally uh, induces tumor formation in the body? If we try to look those things, uh, first and foremost thing is oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is, as we all know that, inside our body, whenever the unwanted chemicals are produced, especially chemically unstable compounds, for example, monoxygen species are... Uh, other uh, lipid peroxidase. So these are the few chemical uh, byproducts of metabolism that generally becomes very unstable and they go on damaging the cellular structure in the body wherever they go. So even they have the potential to go and damage the DNA. DNA that is the basic material, genetic material which is there inside the nucleus, uh, inside the cell. So even, even they can reach up to the DNA and can damage DNA. That is what we are uh, referring to, shortening of uh, telomerase length and other things. So second is inflammation. Inflammation generally, uh, it's, it's a general uh, defense response. Like our basic response, innate response of our body for any sort of uh, demanding situation, whether it's a chemical insert, whether it is pathogens or whether it is any sort of uh, uh, challenge, body tries to develop inflammation and inflammation uh, definitely contributes to uh, apoptosis like few cells get get that opportunity and they try to uh, you know grow further that is what we generally call the escape from apoptosis like program cell death and angiogenesis new blood for vessel formation because it's an opportunity inflammation is a defense uh, response and these uh, deformed the proteins and uh, deformed uh, Know, structures, they take this opportunity to grow and flourish. Even metastasis could be easily achieved through inflammation. And the third important is excessive sympathetic activity. So more or less, whatever we are trying to summarize here, the biological factors which gives rise to uh, tumor formation, because we all know that earlier people used to believe that 
cancer is genetic but now it has been very clearly uh, uh, you know summarized based on uh, the ancient evidences that cancer is not pure genetic it's like one step ahead like epigenetic influences because our genes are not uh, independent they are dependent on the environment where they interact that is where people are talking about uh, epigenetics so if we try to look at uh, the uh, cancer the entire manifestation of cancer in the perspective of epigenetics so we physiologically oxidative stress dna damage inflammation excessive sympathetic activity all these things are somewhere they are they are uh, uh, you know uh, taking us into the path of something called as very interesting uh, self regulation part because uh, whether we talk about unhealthy behaviors or whether we talk about uh, uh, substance abuse whether carcinogenic whether it's a tobacco whether it's a smoke alcohol any sort of uh, uh, you know carcinogenic uh, influences or whether it could be a pure psychological trauma so by and large it is trying to you know uh, uh, make it very simple and clear that somewhere the things are uh, uh, boiling down to self regulation so that is where uh, this the entire uh, concept of uh, what we refer it as vagal theory or vagal theory so why why you vagus nerve why vagal theory how do uh, vagal theory polyvagal theory or vagus nerve is connected to uh, this manifestation of malignancy or even the, a prognosis of cancer because uh, there are so many studies even ample of research clearly states that uh the vagus nerve the activation vagal activation or activation of vagus nerve has a very uh, you know a large amount of uh, good influences on uh, uh, cancer prognosis so based on that if we go on exploring this area further we get to see so many opportunities that is where uh, i thought of taking uh, uh, this connection further in the aspect of preventive oncology because as we all know that right once the cancer is manifested the treatment options and uh, the prognostic outcomes are become very limited so in that perspective why don't we focus more on prevention that to something which we already know but not in a greater detail so that is where this theory uh, makes uh, uh, you know good sense here so vagus nerve before we start polyvagal theory let us try to understand vagus nerve we all know that right uh we have something called as autonomic nervous system part of nervous system it has a sympathetic and parasympathetic division under parasympathetic division the entire automated process of the body that gets uh, uh, that will be controlled by uh, this uh, autonomic nervous system and it has sympathetic and parasympathetic out of uh, the parasympathetic uh, branch vagus nerve shares the maximum part of parasympathetic uh, outflow so as it's a latin term vagus vagus refers to wandering because it start it's a 10th cranial nerve out of 12 pairs of cranial nerve this is the 10th and the longest cranial nerve it actually start from descend from the medulla brain stem and it goes all the way down to uh, the colons like you could uh, imagine above the diaphragm including the facial muscles pharynx larynx esophagus and below diaphragm the below diaphragm the visceral organ so it runs all the way down till colon so the entire uh, vagal outflow uh, when entire vagal activity is com- is composed of 80% sense and 20% motor so that is where it 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 at it attracts great amount of interest from uh, the healthcare as well as from the research community so what is this polyvagal theory how does it make sense because we all know what is vagus nerve and how what is the course of the nerve innervation function we know more or less everything about it but the thing is we have not explored the entirety of this vagal nerve uh, vagus nerve that is where dr stephen porges is uh, the one of the uh, pioneer in this field he coined the theory and he explored this area in a greater detail that is where he developed polyvagal theory poly is referred to many so what is that polyvagal theory the entire polyvagal theory try to uh, uh, summarize and explain if you want to explain it in one statement or one sentence 
how our system or how our body reacts to any sort of challenge. That is what the entire polyvagal theory tried to explain. And it's, it's an evolutionary, uh, the polyvagal theory comes with an evolutionary history because the entire autonomic nervous system, if you see the evolutionary pattern of the reptilian thing, the autonomic nervous system also evolved over a period of phylogenetic history clearly states that from the reptilian uh, uh, response cortex, the entire evolution of our uh, autonomic nervous system gives uh, you know, greater uh, uh, understanding how uh, over a period of time we have developed and conditioned our autonomic nervous system. So the entire polyvagal theory try to explain it is not just the rest and digest because we try to understand vagus nerve is responsible for rest and digest, but it's not just rest and digest. Because most of the time, that is how even in medical schools, that is how we study. Whenever we talk about vagus nerve, vagus is the major branch of parasympathetic and parasympathetic's job is to do exactly opposite as sympathetic. Sympathetic is arousal, like fight or flight response. In, in, uh, in conjunction to that, parasympathetic will be doing the opposite thing, but that's not the whole story of it. It's just a part of it the entire autonomic nervous system plays a huge role in, in the formation of non-communicable disease, in the manifestation of non-communicable diseases. Uh, if you try to see major uh, share of today's uh, disease load comes from non-communicable diseases. And most of the non-communicable diseases are nothing but the autonomic nervous system disorders because somewhere they are related to autonomic nervous system. So, as Dr. Stephen Porges explains, the polyvagal theory, in, in this theory, he explains over uh, the period of evolution, the vagus nerve makes uh, two distinctive uh, branches. That is the old part of the old uh, vagal thing. That is what we call it as dorsal vagal part of the dorsal vagal branch of the parasympathetic. And the new part is the ventral uh, vagal complex are the uh, newer uh, of, uh, you know, part of the vagus nerve. The dorsal is the dorsal means the back, ventral is from, from the front because uh, the dorsal vagal branch runs behind this brainstem and ventral runs in front of the uh, vagal, uh, sorry, brainstem. And it, uh, the dorsal vagal branch runs all the way down below the diaphragm and it regulates the entire visceral content, uh, visceral organs. But when it comes to ventral part of it, it regulates more or less the facial muscles, voice regulation, larynx, trachea, heart, and lung function. So all these things, more or less, these are the functions which are very essential for our connection, communication, and social engagement. So when we talk about uh, newborn children, newborn child, uh, they have demyelinated uh, ventral vagal branch over the period of time as they develop social engagement and communication and connection they develop myelination that is how the entire ventral vagal complex gets conditioned so that is how uh, generally what we learn from uh, self-regulation self-soothing all those things we learn from our childhood so the, these are the uh, you know, very crucial areas because most of the time if you try to understand here we know only fight or flight because when there is a challenge, we know only fight or flight. Or we say that there is rest and digest, but it's not so. Uh, even in the vagal uh, uh, outflow, ventral part of the vagus nerve re regulates rest and digest, rejuvenation, recouping, and re refreshing. All those things happen at the low tone, low tone uh, vagal activity. But when it comes to high tone, that is the dorsal vagal part, that is the survival part of the vagus nerve, that's take, that takes over and generates something called as freeze response or collapse or shutdown. Uh, you might have seen uh, vasovagal syncope or catatonic state where when an organism, especially even if it comes to human being, when we cannot fight back, if we feel helpless and we have nothing much we can do, then system gets into this freeze mode or we call it as total immobilization. So this immobilization is the second line defense. That is the innate one. It, 
it can be uh, uh, referred as a reptilian uh, uh, response you can you could get to see this response when an animal gets into a situation where it completely uh, gets scared and it represents something called as uh, immobilization or fake death so this is also a very essential uh, line of defense but over a period of evolution we have forgotten this part because only we we think and we work on uh, sympathetic and uh, rest and digest part of parasympathetic but that is not so even the dorsal or the immobilization part is something which is very essential to understand why is that so because whenever we talk about self regulation as i said earlier whether it is uh, inflammation whether it is uh, uh, exposure to carcinogens whether it is uh, oxidative stress even whether it is dna damage somewhere whether it is a chemical damage psychological damage or physical damage whether damage could come from any any direction but the most crucial thing in the entire uh, cancer formation or manifestation is something called as self regulation self regulation is could also be referred as self soothing because we we learn to uh, you know manage our emotions that is that is what generally we refer it as self regulation how we regulate our regulate our emotions thoughts and the behavior pattern so why is that so relevant because if we see the causative factors biological causative factors they are nothing but the results of this lack of uh, self regulation and most interestingly the vagal circuit the entire vagal circuit uh, it not only uh, uh, works at the uh, rest or digest part it also in lateralizes the specific uh, brain structure because it involves in the entire emotional regulation whether it is amygdala whether it is a limbic cortex whether it even other uh, uh, higher centers of the brain vagal circuit involves in all those things because that is where we say vagus nerve is associated with emotional even self regulation skills and you know, how we uh, regulate emotions how we uh, you know express ourselves for that we could gather few more details do this looks so scary because there are so many you know uh, alien words here so don't get uh, uh, panicked it just to, uh, the entire picturization of this information is submitting one clear thing that the gaba amino butyric acid receptors in the brain uh, they are scattered all around the brain like major like hippocampus amygdala whether it's insula thalamus uh, pre uh, uh, periaqueductal aqueductal gray there are so many centers in the brain which are known to be uh, the crucial parts in emotional regulation and all these parts are directly uh, you know interconnected with the vagal branches both afferent and efferent both, both motor and sensory branch of uh, vagus nerve uh, is directly connected to all these uh, uh, gaba receptor network so it gives us a clear indication that vagus nerve is greatly involved in our emotional regulation or in other word we could call it as self regulation why is that so uh, important the importance of self regulation is that when self regulation fails we get into dysregulation and if the dysregulation whether we call it as uh, lack of uh, coping skills that is also dysregulation uh, we don't know uh, how to manage our emotion that is also dysregulation um i don't have better uh, strategies to cope with that is also dysregulation so all these uh, you know uh, defense psychological defense measure fails that leads to dysregulation so when there is a dysregulation for a longer time uh, these are not an acute condition these are uh, prolonged uh, conditions when dysregulation goes for a longer period of time that leads to somatoaffective experiences so when there is when the dysregulation becomes intense and prolonged that leaves because most of the people if you see the person who is in the state of dysregulation and they don't have better coping skills they always get stuck in either fight or flight or in freeze condition freeze 
means immobilization condition so they they go out of this you know tolerance window they feel helpless they feel vulnerable and this this is where they start to manifest all these biological risk factors of cancer the lack of uh, self regulation could be because of uh, unresolved trauma it could be ptsd or it could be depression or it could be any anything even a very small uh, stress thing could uh, linger for a longer time and it could be a tra- psychological trauma in certain individuals and that leads to sympathetic nervous system erosion and immobilization are both sometimes it happens so that both sympathetic activation as well as dorsal high tone dorsal vagus that is what high, high tone dorsal is something uh, which is directly related to immobilization of freezing response sometimes either one of it or both of it both of it will be activated that is where the entire physiological process gets uh, disturbed distorted and it even gets into the state of cell signaling and creates lot of uh whether we call in pro inflammatory or inflammatory response or whether we call it as uh, dna damage or oxidative stress so th- th- these are the certain uh, uh pathways where definitely we get to see the changes when we try to understand pro inflammatory pro is before inflammatory are uh, the chemicals which are uh, you know con- congenial for developing inflammatory response Uh, especially they are uh, considered as a most potent carcinogenic compounds in the body these are all uh, uh, intrinsic uh, chemicals which generate within our body especially the cytokines the chemical messengers like interleukin 1 tumor necrosis factor alpha they are pro inflammatory chemicals that that defense thing goes for a task these are not harmful thing but they in turn becomes harmful because of the entire environment in the inside our human system gets uh, totally disturbed and that in turn induces the chemokines that attracts neutrophil uh, sort of white blood cells white blood cell type and that neutrophil is a key it's a very uh, vital uh, thing in the, in the production of a uh, reactive oxygen species and reactive oxygen species are very uh, commonly known for creating oxidative stress and oxidative stress is one of the cause for uh, carcinogenesis or cancer formation the entire cytokine sensing by the vagus nerve happens both the ways like through big 80% of the vagus nerve is sensory and only 20% is motor and even from the macrophage level to the splenic t cell level and throughout sensing the peripheral thing from each and every aspect of our uh, uh, cytokine formation and cytokine uh, uh, you know functioning our vagus nerve try to keep a track on those things and that that makes um, you know vagus nerve very very uh, critical for cytokine regulation in the body cytokines are the primary factors for inflammation and the entire human system has something which is very unique that is called as vagal anti anti inflammatory reflex it's not just rest or digest even beyond rest and digest the vagus nerve has its own its own uh, uh, wide range physiological uh, as well as protective functions because uh, it clearly says when there is a vagal stimulation it reduces oxidative stress these are the findings these are uh, the scientific findings to support how vagal stimulation or uh, increased vagal activity could be a boon to, to curb all the biological risk factors for cancer and if we for example if you try to see the uh, anti inflammatory uh, uh, you know effect of vagus nerve through the peripheral sensing the vigilance cytokine vigilance of the vagus nerve and it immediately sends sends uh, uh, the signal back to the brain by saying the inflammation inflammation is going to happen or it's getting started so we need to slow it down there are mechanism through activating hpa axis hypothalamus pituitary 
axis generally it gets activated during acute stress so it during this process there will be a systemic cortisol secretion cortisol is a steroid hormone that gets secreted during this time so that cortisol is one of the potent anti inflammatory drug that body produces and even via uh, splenic uh, t cell there are uh, you know, spe specific cell mediated uh, immune cells are there like t uh, t cells at the splenic level so even the vagal activation uh, you know activates these t cells and they inhibits the synthesis of inflammatory cytokines through uh, acetylcholine uh, and adrenergic pathways there are you know complicated pathways to it through which this splenic t cell uh, vagal activation induces this splenic t cells to act as an anti uh, inflammatory uh, thing so these are the scientific facts which uh, promotes the vagal stimulation for the prevention even not only the anti inflammatory effect but even if we go further and explore a little uh, you know in detail anti hypoxic effect hypoxia is the lower oxygen levels generally when the sympathetic activity is high uh, whether we call fight or flight response that creates short term or uh, intermittent hypoxic not only intermittent but low grade hypoxic effect and vasoconstriction why is that so because when there is uh, hypoxia it it becomes for, you know favorable ground for uh, tumor flourishing the certain tumors will grow in hypoxic condition and it's prognostic in cancer so can we uh, uh, reduce this hypoxic spell the answer is yes because uh, when we stimulate vagus nerve it in turn inhibits sympathetic activity and also it produces increases production of vasoactive intestinal peptide that is what vip we refer that is the most potent uh, chemical that creates vasodilatation so this vasodilatation happens through vip and that happens only through uh, stimulation of vagus nerve so this anti hypoxic uh, uh, you know effect of vagus nerve is very very critical for Uh, the prevention of any cancerous or any sort of tumor growth even when it comes to healthy behaviors because most of the time uh, we get to see the causative factors are like more or less modifiable modifiable risk factors these risk factors are related to our healthy behaviors which means they are opposite to our healthy behaviors unhealthy behaviors like uh, junk eating sedentary lifestyle or uh, uh, carcinogenic indulgence so all these unhealthy behaviors can be uh, replaced uh, with healthy behaviors through again vagal stimulation because it has been found when there is increased vagal activity the executive functions executive functions uh, becomes Uh, prominent there is a positive influence on individuals executive function like whether it's a decision making it's an uh, problem solving you sustain attention uh, so all, all memory retrieval all those executive functions becomes positively influenced by vagus now so if we see this positive influence of executive function increases uh, the chances of adapting healthy behavior and the actual uh, adoption people be, because people do talk about uh, healthy behavioral options but they they don't uh, uh, you know work on that area and they do not try to adapt those changes but if the positive influence on executive function is established then definitely that in turn uh, you know uh, helps an individual to adapt healthy behavior and makes changes in their lifestyle after that if we go further we could even get to see the anti cancer immunity like right? because immune system plays a vital role in scavenging uh, uh, the cells the these immortal cells in the in their initial stages so there are specific uh, uh, you know cells they are called as myeloid derived suppressor cells mdcs mdsc they expand in the spleen uh, that's an immune organ in the stomach and that suppresses the cytotoxic t cell that is one of the specific uh, uh, cancer scavenging uh, uh, immune cells 
and that gives rise to the formation of tumor and even promote progression in the cancer uh, course and in that condition if we stimulate uh, vagus now there is tff2 the trefoil factor uh, Two, it's a protein coded to TFF2 gene. It's a strong suppressor of this myeloid-derived uh, suppressor cell. In general, the tumor suppressing chemical can be easily suppressed by counter uh, uh, protein that can be easily produced through vagal stimulation. So if we could say that it increases cellular immunity. Uh, when we stimulate vagus now, that cellular immunity is nothing but anti-cancer immunity. And that becomes very, very essential for uh, preventing cancer. In summary, if we try to see how the entire uh, vagal activity is associated with uh, the biological disease formation, there are paths like behavioral paths or biological pathways or even epidemiological uh, paths so in all these areas, if we try to see the self-regulation is the key and lack of self-regulation. And if an individual fails, if he, fa he or she fails to understand the dorsal and the ventral branch of vagus nerve and its expression, and if we fail to switch over because dorsal vagal, that is what we call it as the survival uh, response, the uh, second line defense, which is there in the dorsal uh, vagal branch, that should be uh, uh, that should be there for a few minutes. We cannot, uh, you know, survive with that for a prolonged period of time. But unfortunately, we fail to regulate uh, this switch over. That is where the problems start. When we talk about joy, resilience, wholeness, integration, self-regulation. Yeah, these are the things which are directly uh, connected with the, uh, you know, a balance between the sympathetic adrenal uh, fight or flight response and the limbic cortex and the ventral vagal branch that in turn uh, makes a strong connection between the limbic and neocortex. And the reptilian part, that is the survival uh, uh, the response, what we get from the dorsal vagal. That is also very essential. Only, only in an emergency is where we feel helpless. We can't fight back or even we can't flee from the situation. So in, in that condition, this uh, dorsal vagal branch becomes our uh, savior. So the, this, it's an integration of all the three, but this switch over from which one activation to the other activation uh, remains the key factor. So this switching over is generally, we can refer it as self-regulation. The question remains, how do we develop self-regulation? And how do uh, we stimulate vagus nerve? Yoga is the most effective, and uh, obviously it's very economical tool uh, to stimulate vagus nerve. Studies after studies, uh, you get to see uh, in the scientific world, like every day you get to hear Vegas Naru, Vegas Naru, because these days it is very trendy to see uh, people talking about Vegas now. Why is that? Because of these reasons. It's not just anti cancer uh, 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 influence, even when it comes to uh, uh, any non, non communicable diseases, whether it is uh, allergic rhinitis, to whether it is cardiovascular disease, all the non-communicable diseases can be effectively prevented and managed through activating vagal nerve. For that, the most in effective and most uh, uh, you know, economical way is through yoga. Uh, to understand that if we talk about pranayama, like in the West, people are using a lot of breath work uh, to condition uh, reconditioning reptilian brain. Reptilian brain is what we are talking about, the dorsal uh, vagal branch. Uh, the entire uh, regulation, the adaptive mechanisms can be reprogram uh, reprogrammed through breath because uh, when we talk about breathing, because it is again directly related to the vagal outflow. And when we talk about body awareness, because in yoga, uh, we talk more of uh, the awareness component, component, whether it is asana, whether it is relaxation, any part, more or less all the practices, especially the physical postures, we talk about awareness. And by the awareness and 
because the awareness thing is up between the mind body component because we are switching our experiences physiological experiences and we are trying to analyze at the mind level so this switching over between the experiences uh, in this vagal trunk uh, helps to rebalance and regulate uh, our responses that in turn you can say it helps to enhance better uh, uh, equilibrium in this ventral and dorsal and even fight or flight response so in in uh, in a complex way if we try to see whether it is a bot bottom up uh, processing or whether it is a top down processing uh, mechanism of yoga there are so many components attached to it not only the asana or pranayama or other thing the entire uh, the practices Uh, lifestyle practices even psychological modification enhancing self regulation following certain disciplinary uh, activities so all these things cumulate collectively uh, gives an idea that in both the ways from upside top down uh, process, uh, pathways and uh, bottom up process in both the ways the yoga practices helps to re-establish a better self-regulation because ultimately one has to develop better self-regulation because that is the only key to uh, uh, enhance vagal activity. So I'm not going to confuse uh, with so much of uh, you know medical terminologies but the entire slide is up to how an individual could cope with external demands in a better way. demands are not always uh, uh, explained in the external con- context demands could be internal external uh, any sort sometimes we do face unrealistic demands sometimes we do feel non existing demands so demands are demand ultimately we need to understand this thing all the yoga practices the entirety of yoga is focused on enhancing self regulation through developing better mind body awareness and cultivating the attitude of mindfulness so that gives an opportunity it's not that we are working only on the vagal stimulation that is the by product of yoga because when we do asanas we are not thinking of uh, activating vagus nerve we are thinking of cultivating something better we want to explore our potentials that is what the actual purpose we go with the all these health benefits are by products of this process so the in in general enhancing self self regulation is the uh, key of practicing yoga so i there is uh, more to it but let me uh, try to stop here because i don't want to drag it further if there are any questions i would be happy to take questions uh thank you very much any questions please to ask uh sir uh, can i ask a question yes yes please sir what uh, particular practices of yoga and pranayam generally uh, stimulates the vagus now specifically no no there is no such thing called as one practice or one asana pranayama will uh, activate vagus nerve because most of the people do think doing sarva sarvangasana will help or doing uh, ujjayi pranayama will activate vagus nerve it's not just uh, the mechanical pressure or the musculoskeletal manipulation that activates vagus nerve as i said it could be from the uh, bottom up regulation or it could be from top down regulation means you can manipulate your mental process that can in turn leads to activation of vagus nerve or you can do musculoskeletal manipulation through asana pranayama mudra bandha even kriyas even doing kriyas will also have a great uh, impact on vagal uh, activity so it's not just one practice collectively more or less all the practices in the uh, yoga category will influence uh, vagal activity 
So basically, it is we need to work on the mind and the thoughts and the. Uh, Uh, so it may like uh, yoga nidra and these kind of activities which are uh, acting more on manomaya kosha will help more yeah definitely because see because when we talk about self regulation even even to uh, activate vagus nerve self regulation is the key if i'm not able to regulate my emotions then obviously i will be in the dorsal branch of the vagus nerve so that is where uh, people get confused they think that only doing this asana will activate uh, vagal nerve yeah that might be there for like couple of uh, minutes that won't be of any use that would be like uh, immediate effect because somebody uh, is going through with pain or any sort of discomfort or disease they might need a prolonged vagal activate prolonged uh, vagal stimulation that comes only through practicing all the components of yoga not just doing one or two practice even by doing meditation you can activate you can generate uh, vagal stimulation and we have uh, what exactly is the link between hypoxia and uh, cells uh, mutation uh actual mechanism is yet to explore but so far so what uh, the scientific community has found was when there is a, a low oxygen level in the blood that favors uh, the growth of uh, carcinogenic cells like the cells which are growing rapidly proliferating cells become very aggressive the mechanism would be i it's an hypothetical one uh, because when there is hypoxia it might increase something called as vascular endothelial growth factor vgf1 that is something which is very essential in developing new blood vessels if there are uh, new connection new blood vessels and the proliferating cell gets more uh, nutrition and it can grow aggressively so i think it might be because of uh, angiogenesis yet to explore uh, that area in detail but so far so we got only that much like uh, hypoxia could be one of the promoting factor i'm not talking about intermittent hypo hypoxia they found was like hypoxic condition could in uh, you know interfere with uh, the proliferative growth of the cell still it's it's like uh, uh, in an infancy we a lot of research has to take place in this area to clear out uh, these confusions and another thing is like uh, when we do pranayama and yoga it uh, works on the telomer um, i'm not getting the exact telomeres of dna am i talking correctly telom tell uh, dna uh, length we call telomeres the end uh, point so it works on that so doing yoga and uh, uh pranayama it affects the uh, genes and genetics like if it is in genes it can be uh, avoided prevented easily yeah definitely because there are uh, certain genes called as anco genes we do all have uh, those anco genes and they can generate uh, malignancies but they will be in a dormant state when there is any sort of insult or damage to the dna that happens generally through shortening of the telomerase telomerase shortening telomerase is like a lace that yeah. holds uh, this entire chromosome pattern if there is any damage to this dna structure that in turn activates these uh, anco genes and that again gives rise to uh, the tumor genesis formation of malignancies so uh, whether healthy eating uh, doing yoga practices pranayama a meditation relaxation all those components are very essential in uh, you know in preventing uh, telomerase shortening and preventing dna damage because it's not a, a unidirectional approach it is always multidimensional approach because dna damage can even happen through oxidation oxidative stress because of free radicals it can even happen because of chemical exposure it could happen because of physical repeated physical injuries or it could be because of repeated viral infections so there are so many possibilities to it so the better approach would be uh, we should always adopt multi dimensional approach thank you sir welcome and yeah so in chat box let me check there are so many questions
paralysis of any part of the body is involved with this uh, shutdown aspect no no paralysis is related to uh, what we call it as stroke whether it's ischemic or uh, uh, you know hemorrhagic stroke where there will be a structural anatomical damage to the brain tissue that what regulates uh, the motor aspect of it that uh, we are not talking about that paralysis this is like uh, short term uh, uh, for a couple of minutes person experience like the heart rate goes slow the metabolic rate goes slow like if somebody have a severe cut there will be an excess bleed so in order to preserve the life body tries to shut down the system and bp goes slow metabolic rate goes slow more or less people become completely immobile so that it can uh, preserve the life but it is nothing to do with that uh, paralysis or any other stroke kind of thing and next question is why cancer is developing in old age because old age is the very common uh, fertile ground for cancer manifestation because when we talk about old age the senescent cell like as we grow older the degeneration will become very aggressive the degenerative changes in the body favors uh, this mutational uh, pattern of cancer so generally it is a favorable condition old age Uh, the immune system will be weak degeneration will be in uh, in an aggressive form and body's anti inflammatory system would be compromised so all these things favors uh, the manifestation of cancer in old age uh, so one more question how uh, lymphatic system uh, and uh, you know uh, this uh, uh, cleaning of uh, cells so yeah. like we are generally not working on parasympathetic uh, this uh, lymphatic system so this is uh, causing uh, inflammation and which is causing cancer so uh, uh, parallelly we have to work on lymphatic system too no no whenever whenever we go for uh, musculoskeletal manipulation for example when you do asana or any any form of exercise we are indirectly working on uh, lymphatic circulatory musculoskeletal and even uh, nervous system so uh, you, we don't have to worry people do think massage is the only way we can work on uh, lymphatic system uh, that's a myth there is no such thing called as like this is the only thing for uh, lymphatic thing all the physical uh, you know exercise forms do have direct effect on lymphatic flow so once we uh, you know adapt these practices i think that will take care of uh, lymphatic flow nothing to worry so the next question is any mantra therapy for cancer see again i repeat mantra therapy again mantra has its own uh, science behind it's a uh, i know orig- uh, the entire mantra therapy comes from nadi yoga concept so here people are working aggressively in this area where uh, the uh, constructive interferences of uh, what we call it as resonating effect and that in turn uh, interferes the physioelectric changes in uh, uh, in the cell so there are uh, you know certain studies interesting studies which are happening in that area but so far so yeah it definitely even in the cancer even in the preventive aspect of it mantra and music therapy and mantra therapy is definitely because it's ultimately a sound therapy that is definitely helping out people but exact mac mechanism it to explore and uh, next question are the free radicals the same that damage dna or cellular damage see when we talk about uh, free radicals they are very unstable chemicals they go and damage it, whether it is a cell membrane whether it is a nucleus whether it is a dna wherever they go they just damage the structure so they don't have any barrier uh, like only the uh, cellular damage because when we talk about cellular damage even the organelles within the cell becomes uh, the target for it next question is breath you mentioned breath work and how different is it from pranayama see again when we talk about breath work that that is just uh, a synonym for it 
because in pranayama philosophically we might say pranasya ayamaha we talk about subtle uh, uh, you know expression of life like uh, bioplasmic energy and manipulating that energy through uh, you know voluntary breath regulation but in the west they they just go by the name of uh, breath work voluntarily because breathing is an involuntary process and in breath work they are trying to voluntarily regulate the breath like taking a deep breath and holding it for a certain amount of time and exhaling slowly so more or less the breath work concept comes from pranayama only because the expression of pranayama start with breath i mean regulating the breathing pattern so cancer is mainly because of suppressed emotions uh, any findings in that in this regard the answer is definitely yes because everything psychological is physiological and everything physiological is psychological and when we talk about emotions emotions are like like phys physical uh, sorry physiological uh, expressions that is where we can feel emotions we can't feel thoughts but we can definitely feel our emotions that feeling is nothing but the physiological change response to the emotion so if we are suppressing emotion yeah it might generate some sort of fight or flight response for a certain amount of time then if we fail to regulate ourselves we if we fail to manage our emotion and if we suppress emotion rather sublimating emotion because the art of regulating emotion is sublimation not suppression if we suppress it directly we are getting into the dorsal vagal uh, branch of the parasympathetic nerve that is again causing lot of physiological problem including cancer and uh, mainly reasons for prostate cancer see again uh, i would like to repeat the same thing exact cause for any form of cancer because there are hundreds of different varieties of cancers so far we get to see but the exact causative factors are very hard to find but we could make a probable list like as i mentioned earlier like oxidative stress dna damage and uh, over sympathetic overdrive so all these are like you could say probable causative factor so we have to again uh, look for uh, risk factors which could uh, generate these changes in the body and that in turns uh, manifest as a cancer right so i think is is there any symptoms of formation stage of cancer the thing is uh, for any cancer until it becomes visible like if it if there is no palpable mass if there is no physiological interferences or physically we can recognize it it, it will be in a you know dormant state it is very diff, uh, you know find out but uh, advancement in the area of uh, cancer healthcare people are uh, developing lot of uh, you know early detective methods like screening uh, test blood test and other uh, imaging techniques through which uh, definitely we can detect early stages of cancer i think yeah so far there are on the questions uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity uh, thank you very much thank you so much dr vijay kumar for such a fresh new and amazing perspective i'm sure you have given all our participants a lot to think and research about for this weekend without wasting much time let us move on to the second session today we have with us uh, mrs smita our international speaker i would like to introduce her to all of you it's an immense pleasure i have worked uh, under her and also heard a lot about her from dr nagendra ji and dr nagratna ji and raguram ji um, mrs smita is a senior mind body intervention specialist integrative medicine center uh, of university of texas md anderson cancer centers integrative medicine program 
She has a master's degree in yoga therapy and is also a certified yoga therapist. Smita has been practicing yoga therapy for specific ailments for over 18 years at various hospitals and clinics. She brings rich and diverse experience as a yoga therapist working with different populations. She has spent the last decade at MD Anderson Cancer Center working with hundreds of cancer patients. On the clinic side, she works alongside with other integrative medicine clinicians using yoga therapy with inpatients and outpatients going through cancer from diagnosis through end of life. On the research side, she is involved in developing and teaching yoga research interventions for different cancer populations like breast, lung, brain, head, and neck cancers. She also works with couples or caregivers going through cancer journey using yoga therapy. Smita continues to teach one-on-one -on -one and group classes for our patients and caregivers. She also mentors many yoga therapists. She has co-authored yoga publications and has presented her work at national and international conferences on the efficacy of yoga in cancer. Mrs. Smita, we welcome you to today's program. I request you to start your session, ma'am. Over to you. Thank you, Sahana, for a very gracious, wonderful introduction. Namaste to everyone. Greetings from Houston, Texas in US, where it is early morning for us and around the globe in India, it's evening for you guys. It's such a honor and pleasure to be here, Sahana. Thank you for this honor and uh, opportunity to present and share. Let me just bring my slides up. I hope you guys can see the slides and hear me okay before I get started. Yes, we can see the slides and hear you. Awesome, thank you. So welcome everyone. Um, as Sahana mentioned, the topic for today for my talk is yoga in cancer care, prevention and management. So, uh, you have had the opportunity to hear two wonderful speakers yesterday and to Dr. Vijay today. So I'll do my best to maybe contribute and show, um, throw some light on some perspectives again around uh, yoga and cancer care. So let's get started. A quick outline, we'll just go around cancer and risk factors in cancer, which you might have heard yesterday and today as well. We'll also look into yoga and cancer care, prevention and management. And I'll also touch upon um, clinical practice guidelines of bringing yoga into clinical practice and some references that I've used for this study. So when we talk, when we look at the modern day lifestyle and the evolution of science in the last hundred years, we see that you know, uh, man has done everything to conquer um, including the recent pandemic and the vaccination and the mass vaccination that is going on around the world and everything. Along with the scientific advancement of the last 100 to 200 years, we have seen that also there is a disconnect for human from his own core nature, his himself. And what yoga can do is actually to bridge this gap and help ourselves to give best to our health and well-being. Again, coming back quickly to cancer, you have heard uh, quite a bit yesterday and today, but very quickly to understand cancer is not necessarily one disease. It is a group of diseases involving mainly abnormal cell growth with potential to invade other parts of the body, which we call as metastasis or stage four. And worldwide, an estimated 19 million new cancer cases and about 10 million cancer deaths occurred in 2020, just the year you know, that we passed. And the good news is one third or up to 40%, or depending on what literature you look into, some literature even claim up to 50, 60% or more of the cancers can be prevented. So this is really the line that we are trying to work in yesterday's and today's webinar is, can we prevent and what can we actually do to prevent? You also have, you are familiar with the Panchakosha model. Dr. Nagarat Naditi, my guru and mentor, went well in depth yesterday on Panchakosha model. And you have heard and understood 
in general, in yoga therapy, in yoga philosophy, when we talk, we are looking at Panchakosha model. So modern medicine, the World Health Organization's definition of health, which includes that health is not just physical, but also mental, social, spiritual levels, is a very recent you know, definition of health. But medicine and health you know, just started at the physical level. But yogic texts and the rishis and the seers of yoga have understood human existence definitely much more beyond the physical level. And we have the Panchakosha that is a comprehensive you know, understanding of the human existence at various level. And importantly, when we understand this and the risk factors, what is important is to understand that the application or the prevention is not at the just at the physical level. It is not just at can I eat healthy, can I exercise, but it goes beyond into the emotional, social, spiritual levels also. So let us look at the risk factors for cancer from the lens of Panchakosha. So now that we know that there are five layered existence and what are some of the risk factors at each level. So one of the risk factors that is top on the list is obesity and sedentary lifestyle. We see that again, uh, the urban lifestyle and people in the cities especially are much more prone to obesity and sedentary lifestyle. You know, high calorie food will come to obesity in a minute. And then the next is genetics, chronic injury or repeated physical um, irritation. I just heard Dr. Vijay was sharing about this and certain infectious agents, including you know, viruses, bacteria, parasites that can cause cancer. We know, you know HPV cancer, which can be prevented again with um, some immunization vaccination. Contact with other carcinogens. Again, tobacco is a well-established carcinogen. And the last 20, 25 to 30 years, there has been a tremendous amount of work you know, around the world in actually um, creating programs for tobacco cessation or reducing the amount of tobacco usation. More work needs to be done in developing countries and other areas, but definitely a huge stride from where it was, you know, two to three decades ago and now, and other known chemicals like asbestos, benzenes, and others. Other environmental exposures, like exposure to radiation, pesticides, heavy metal exposures, all come under the physical risks at Andamaya Kosha. Dietary causes like sugar, alcohol, smoking, all these are basically carcinogens that can increase cancer incidence or puts us at, at, at higher risk. Coming to obesity, this is the map of obesity from 2019 from United States of America. And if you go into um, the um, website for CDC, Center for Disease Control in US, you see the uh, increased rate of obesity in the last 10 to 20 years. And overall, um, US has obesity incidence of more than 43%, which is extremely high and puts the entire population at risk for various diseases, including cancer. And you can see this map here has um, you know, shades to see what is the level of obesity in each state across US. And you can see a lot of states in the darkest range you know, in the maroon or burgundy, which is about more than 35% of the population in these states are in obese category. Coming to body weight and cancer risk. Obesity is clearly linked with an increased risk to several types of cancers, including this, you know, list below. Again, this is not from um, any one study, or this is not from any one source. This is the source from American Cancer Society, which basically is a cumulative source of various, you know, um, surveys and studies that are published. So it's a very clear link that obesity can increase cancer, you know, incidence to breast cancer, a lot of GI cancers, esophageal, stomach, colon, and um, you know, rectal cancers ovarian and endometrial cancers. These are the cancers that are hormone regulated. So we know in women, obesity or excess weight is you know, related to enhanced estrogen activity, thereby you know, increasing the risk for these hormonal cancers in women, liver, kidney, pancreas, thyroid, multiple myeloma, meningioma, and others also. Again, this little slide, this little picture image from the you know, coronaries from the American Institute for 
cancer research, ACR, which again talks about the causes of weight gain or increased weight, which is you know, uh, indicated to Western diet, fast foods. And you see that this entire Western food is percolating around the world into different you know, food cultures, uh, especially in developing countries due to extensive marketing of these high calorie foods. And we see McDonald's, Fructose and others even in you know, Indian advertising and media where these are all advertised repeatedly and going to McDonald's or another place that is of Western diet is fancied upon. So in where in actually in US, if you see McDonald's is, uh, is at the very low level of the food chain and people who cannot afford good food actually go to these restaurants in US, but it's on the contrary in the other countries, this is fancied upon. In fact, recently, a couple of years ago, there was a big article in New York Times, which talked about um, a developing country like Chile was actually overtaken by the big giants of marketing like Fructose, Lay's and McDonald's, where this country actually has a problem of malnutrition, but also obesity is high because of the extensive marketing of um, such, you know, food giants that is taking over actually around the world. And also the uh, picture talks about extensive screen time for both adults and children. And in pandemic, you know, everybody working from home, this has increased, the screen time for everybody has increased and the lack of physical activity and uh, sedentary lifestyle is much more on the rise in the last year than ever before. Coming to the risk factors at the pranamaya kosha, we understand in yoga that there are nadis at the pranic channels in the body through which the prana flows. The pranic blockages among the main pranic nadis can you know, um, create pranic imbalances in the body. Again, another um, area that impacts the prana in the body is the dietary imbalances. So these deficiencies, like the Western diet, um, which is so low on pranic value versus the yogic diet or the sattvic diet, which is high, also makes a big impact on this. Wrong lifestyle patterns causing pranic uh, blockage or deficiency. Again, dinacharya, rutucharya, the activity that we do in sync with the biological rhythms enhances or preserves our pranic energy, wherein uh, going against these rhythms actually depletes prana. Coming to Manomaya Kosha, again, a lot of discussions um, have been happening in the last session on the role of mind, emotion, depression, suppression, leading to imbalances and causing cancer. Um, uncontrolled high stress. Again, in the next couple of slides, I'll try to go a little more into the stress, but stress, which was supposed to be a protective you know, phenomenon for the life to thrive, Stress is when there is an external danger or threat to the life or the survival. This is what stress was supposed to mean. It is supposed to protect us. But the same stress now, you know, from the hunter-gatherer's age where probably stress was when there was a tiger, you know, that is attacking human and you have to run and the whole stress mechanism kicks in to protect yourself. From the modern day stress, which basically is getting a bad email from a you know, a boss or a superior at work or um, an, another emotional stress where there is ego defense mechanism that is coming up. These are the modern day stressors where the stress is not knowing to reach that homeostasis that once the stress is gone, the system has to regain homeostasis. And the lack of this is what really is triggering the continued stress mechanism leading from a acute stress to a chronic stress. Now, there are chronic stressors for people in life. I'm not saying everybody's stress is just in your head, but the stress that was experienced thousands of years ago and the stress in the modern day in 21st century that we experience has definitely changed and evolved. So the negative emotions, you know, the entire um, shlokas from Bhagavad Gita where Krishna talks about dhyayato vishayan punsaha, how the mind gets caught up in this small stress stimuli and we go on picking up the speed, thinking about the same thing, leading to, you know, buddhi nashat pranashati, where there is entire lack of power of discrimination for the mind and you identify yourself with this external stress that is happening. And also not to mention trauma, 
is a great work that is um, being, uh, you know, a great deal of work is done in the area of trauma that can be physical trauma, mental trauma, emotional trauma, under the bigger umbrella of PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, and what happens, you know, um, in the childhood and the developmental age can put people at a greater risk for uh, cancer at a later stage of age. And again, we see with different uh, studies that the role of mind or stress actually plays a higher role than eating and exercising. I've worked with cancer population uh, in the last you know, 10 years with thousands of cancer patients. And many cancer patients come to ask, I eat healthy food, I exercise every day, I don't know why I got cancer. So the role of mind or stress is something that is very generally overlooked upon, but which is very powerful and can contribute in cancer prevention. Coming to you know, stress and cancer, the sympathetic nervous system regulation, for the longest time, oncologists and scientists did not believe or relate cancer as in you know, to stress. Cancer is so complex, you know, nobody knows what causes it, or the factors are too many. And you know, you know, no, stress or mind is not a great deal. But today, more than ever, especially in the last 10 to 15 years, we know how stress can regulate, you know, tumor microenvironment. Even today, we hesitate to say that stress may not directly cause cancer, but it can promote cancer growth, you know, given. Uh, in the right scientific sense, we can say that cancer can promote tumor, you know, uh, disturb the tumor microenvironment, meaning what, how the cancer can grow or metastasize can be, you know, uh, impacted by stress, especially unmanaged, uncontrolled stress. So we also know from the telomere attrition, the DNA, where the telomeres actually, the length of DNA telomere can uh, dictate how uh, the longevity of the person is, you know, um, looked at. Chronic stress leads to telomere attrition and thereby speeds up the aging process. So when people talk about anti-aging and cancer, it is not just, I look good doing yoga for a longer time, but actually there are changes in your DNA level if you practice yoga with a broader yogic lifestyle that you can slow down the aging process. One question a few minutes ago was, you know, why do we see more cancer in aged population? And Dr. Vijay said, you know, aging itself is a cancer risk. So practicing yoga can actually buffer, you know, that risk. And coming back to stress in yoga, chronic stress makes our body more hospitable to cancer growth. And chronic stress also disrupt other health behaviors. So we need to understand that stress is not just I'm getting stressed and there is a tumor growth that is happening in the body, but stress is also that because I'm stressed, I'm not able to live a healthy lifestyle. I'm probably not eating. When people are stressed, this is when people really look for you know, recreation. And when we talk about stress management with people, people say, oh, I go and get a drink for stress management. I go watch a movie for stress management. So everything that people do in the name of stress management that is not in a healthy realm basically contributes to this cancer growth in the body. And that is why stress becomes a indirect, not only direct, but also an indirect cause for increasing cancer risk. Along with other behavioral you know, risks, stress also can change the biology influence in different behaviors as I discussed now. And in cancer patients who have diagnosed disease cancer in their body, there is also literature to show that stress decreases the efficacy of chemotherapy. So that is why there are a lot of studies that are showing that actually introducing yoga in cancer patients will actually make them responsive to cancer treatments like chemo or radiation, protecting their physiology, biology, but also enhancing the response to treatment and emotional response to cancer can actually influence both morbidity and mortality in cancer population, which is huge because even after the diagnosis, if patients can adopt a healthy lifestyle, they can you know, lengthen or have healthier lifestyle with good quality of life after the treatment. Coming to other risk, another risk factors, risk factor, which is sleep, which is not necessarily talked about a lot. Um, a couple of years ago, 
um, Nobel was given to, you know, the circadian rhythm and, you know, Nobel in medicine was given to circadian rhythm, where now we have actually more understanding to this. And when we talk about, you know, circadian rhythm, it is basically the cycle that our body adopts to the day and night cycle. This is one of many other biological clocks that the body has. So depending on when there is sunrise, sunset, and what we do, we have an entire hundreds and thousands of different biological processes that are going in the body that is in rhythm with this. And the disruption to sleep can actually increase risk for cancer. And many people are surprised, but the day and night cycle, which basically is regulated by a hormone called melatonin, is what you know, regulates the sleep cycle in the uh, people. And late night, one such simple you know, risk is late night viewing of screen. People are attached to their screen or on phone, on TVs, watching many, many soap operas, serials, or even replying to email. And the most now is social media, that people are sticking to social media throughout. And this light that is emitted from the screen can disrupt uh, melatonin secretion that is you know, perceived through your eyes. And this melatonin secretion disruption for a long time is a risk for you know, sleep disturbances. And there are many studies, if you look up night shift workers, so people who sh you know, work night shifts like nurses, air hostess, and we know in the mechanical industry, uh, in developing worlds, there is a lot of night shift work that is given to people. And this continuous disruption of night shift cycle is an increased risk to cancer. And not only that, when it comes to sleep and decree increased risk, many uh, cancer treatment itself actually disrupts uh, patients' sleep cycles. And more than 50% of cancer patients actually have uh, significant sleep disturbances that is not you know, known. And the sleep disturbances leading to fatigue and sleepiness or drowsiness throughout the day. So that is why you see fatigue, drowsiness as an increased symptom burden in cancer patient. But yoga can help in this. Our own studies from MD Anderson shows that yoga can buffer the effects of all these kinds of sleep disturbances. So there is a lot of potential to adopting a yogic lifestyle. Moving on to you know, risk factors at Vijnana Maya Kosha. When we look at the um, yoga and the uh, jnana yoga and the concepts of um, you know, vijnana and understanding, we see manas, buddhi, ahankara, and chitta are the four components of the mind that is looked at. And in the vijnana maya kosha, deep-rooted suppressions, wrong notions, thoughts, phobias, neurosis are all basically something that is beyond the mind. These create a strong samskaras leading to vasanas, and they become so strong in the you know, system that becomes your second nature of defense. And if there are events or activities that has deep-rooted trauma, it is not just at the you know, manomaya kosha level that there is a disturbance, that this was uncomfortable, an experience of negative emotion, but this is something that roots and stays longer. And long-term lifestyle activities that are out of the sink with the basic rhythms of life and blockages that come from the higher centers. What I mean by this is there is a lot of I know what to do, but people don't do this. And uh, Dr. Nagratna calls this a Duryodhana syndrome, right? Janami dharmam nachame pravrittihi, janami adharmam nachame nivrittihi. I know what is good to do, but I am unable to practice it. I know what is wrong, but I'm unable to, you know, retire from these wrongdoings in life. And Vignana Maya Kosha is that level where we have the wisdom but the manomaya kosha continuously takes over. These are some of the risk factors at that level. And when you look at the AICR recommendations and guidelines, we um, see that it's almost recommending a yogic lifestyle, maintain a healthy weight, be physically active, eat a diet that is rich in vegetables, limit or you know, um, take off red meat or processed meat, limit the consumption of uh, sweetened beverages, limit alcohol consumption, limit fast foods. And you know, for women, if you can, you know, whenever uh, is the fertile age and whenever you have baby, you know, breastfeed. Breastfeeding actually has 
a lot of uh, potential benefits in uh, keeping the uh, cancer risk away for women, which is very, very important. And then after a diagnosis of cancer, if you can follow the recommendations and um, also another recommendation is try not to use supplements. Again, when um, curcumin or turmeric became a magic drug around the world, people you know, try to take all these supplements trying to prevent cancer. And we also know from the literature that it's not these compounds that are cancer preventative, but it is the holistic synergetic effect of these food. So the best is in Indian diet, we know we use turmeric so much, we use a lot of fruits, vegetable, a lot of uh, you know people are vegetarians for the most part, which is changing now though. So all this can be basically a natural low level risk for people from such cultures where it is much more easy you know, to follow, but these are some of the recommendations from American Institute for Cancer Research. Now shifting gears to the role of yoga and lifestyle, how yoga and yogic lifestyle can actually play a role. Again, I will try not to preach to the choir. I'm assuming a lot of you are from the yoga background. If you're not, my recommendation is to educate yourself to yoga, not just with postures, but with the philosophy, but with the you know yoga with a capital Y, where it talks about yoga as a way of life. And we know from the definition from the textbooks from Yoga Vashista, Mana Prashamana Upayaha, where Vashista Rishi is talking about Prashamana. And from the Pachan Patanjali Yoga Sutra, Yoga Chitta Vritti Nirodaha, Samatvam Yoga Uchyate from Bhagavad Gita. All these talks about yoga, not at the physical level, but yoga at the broader level, what happens at the mind, at the intellect is what is addressed. And then basis of yoga therapy, uh, wonderful contribution from uh, Vivekananda, Swami Vivekananda, Yoga Anusandhana, Samsthana, the life contribution of uh, Guruji and Dr. Nagratna Didi, where they have created this model of yoga therapy at the Panchakosha, explored unparalleled than you know, anyone else, where we look at the human existence, not just at the Annamaya Kosha level, but the Koshas beyond, which is Prana, Mana, Vijnana, and Anandamaya Kosha. So one of the biggest differences from the Western modern medicine to yoga therapy is the approach in the concept where yoga therapy approaches the individual beyond the physical body, wherein there is this reductionistic perspective, which is needed in cancer care, again, not wrong, there is advantages to both, but then you know addressing the whole person helps maybe eliminating the root of cancer rather than just you know doing the symptom control or the symptom burden management. So coming back to the definition of stress that you have heard again, the understanding of stress in yoga is that the stress is speed. What kind of speed? Stress is uncontrolled, unmanaged, you know, speed at all levels, not just at the body level. So when we understand stress as speed, the goal of yoga therapy is to reduce the speed at all different levels. So coming back to Annamaya Kosha practices, what can we do at the physical level to manage or prevent you know, cancer? Optimization and balance basically, where we are bringing the balance with various organs and systemic intelligence. What is systemic intelligence? What happens at the nervous system impacts your you know cardiovascular system impacts your gut system impacts your gi and today we know there is much more you know um, emotional regulation that is happening in the gut through the microbiome more you know neurochemicals in the gut than in the brain so all these days um, medicine was worried about what happens at the brain the brain but ayurveda yoga a lot of these you know, traditional systems of medicine continues to look at GI system and eating is, or um, the, the digestion at the GI system is not just with the food, but also with the emotions. And we talk with this, with you know, ajirna, atijirna, kujirna, which I'm going to come in the next slide, but the systemic intelligence of what happens in one system impacting the other system is extremely important to know because one is part of the whole and you know the whole is part of the uh, one like we understand in the purnamadaha purnamidam right practices like 
asana, shatkarmas, relaxation practices, all these restores the balance at the body level. Again, when we talk about shatkarmas or kriyas, there are certain contraindicated at certain times of cancer treatment. So please um, be very mindful. Do not um, implement these practices. If you are a cancer patient, do not implement on yourself. This needs to be done under the expert guidance. And when we talk about all these practices at the body level, we see that it is to loosen, relax, and to balance. So at the body level, the nature of the physical body is to be relaxed. And all these practices are basically enhancing that rest at the body level. And through yogic sattvic diet, there is nourishment to the body and the mind. And we see that the role of turmeric and other anti-inflammatory foods can play a huge role. What you eat, what you put in your body has a huge implication in cancer prevention. And we know again, now newer studies, uh, intermittent fasting is a huge fight now. People are really uh, trying to fast themselves for 12 to 16 hours. And there are actually clinical studies that show the fasting can have anti-cancer effect and it also can reduce chemotherapy and use DNA damage, triggering anti-cancer immunity in the body. So again, I'm not an expert dietitian. I'm neither a medical doctor, but these are all the data that is you know, populating in the field that really begs the question that you know, um, cultures like the um, yogic lifestyle basically had much more information on preventing all diseases, including cancer for that matter. Coming to guidelines for physical activity from American Cancer Society. So it is important that everyone maintains a healthy weight range and adults, the recommendation is get at least about 150 to 300 minutes of modern uh, intensity or about 100, 250 minutes of vigorous intense activity. So when you say moderate or vigorous intense activity, moderate yoga is considered as a moderate in intensity activity, running or other cardio programs are considered as high intensity activity. Uh, if you ask me, the best is you get a combination of these. So children's and teens, the recommendation is at least get an hour of moderate, uh, moderate to vigorous intense activity every day. For adults, you can see that it is per week recommendation, but for children need really much more physical activity than others. Limit sedentary behaviors, just, just such as sitting, lying down, watching TV and other forms of screen-based entertainment. So since you know, working from home and chair bound uh, jobs are becoming more, a lot of people also have standing desk instead of sitting and working. If you can stand up, put your computer or your laptop on a higher you know, elevated level and get you know, standing exercise because even standing engages a lot of your muscles rather than sitting. So really getting creative in ways that you can get you know, your exercise is important. Coming to other guidelines from American Cancer Society, you know, foods that are high in nutrient um, and that can help to get you stay healthy. So again, these are basically a variety of vegetables, mainly vegetables that you can, if you can limit a lot of carbohydrate-based vegetables, but increase vegetables like dark leaf green vegetables, vegetables that are uh, high in water content, um, fruits similarly, and also of fruits, vegetables, and legumes that are rich in fiber. Fiber also contributes in microbiome. So if you can get yourself an anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory diet, which basically is you know, what the sattvic diet that yoga recommends is nothing but this. Um, whole grains is important instead of you know, refined, polished grains. And again, um, the recommendations are going towards limiting meat consumption. Uh, again, a couple of years ago in 2019, uh, World Health Organization came back with a list of, you know, meats that can, that are carcinogenic, which means it directly has a risk to increase cancer, which we have seen for a long time. But um, again, now with westernization, um, a lot of vegetarians for generations are, you know, converting into liberal, you know, non-vegetarian eaters. And even um, a lot of people understand that vegetarians can get low protein. So there are a lot of concerns around that, that people really, um, you know, try to convert into a non-vegetarian diet. 
again, there is a huge potential in continuing vegetarian diet because it is not just about protein, but it is the holistic synergy and nutritional value that you need to be getting from your food. So um, limiting red and processed meat, sugar again is considered, um, there is a lot of research coming in the area of sugar, especially processed white sugar is, you know, something that increases or disrupts the entire metabolic activity, increasing the glycemic load in the body. So that is an area that you can continue to limit or go for some sugar alternatives. Not that sugar alternatives are the best. In general, limiting sugar of any kind is good, but some sugar alternatives that are safe can be used as well. Um, stay away from, you know, highly processed um, grains or food. And recently, again, American Cancer Society endorsed uh, alcohol as a carcinogen, which means that the, you know, heart recommendation, drink a glass of wine for your healthy heart is all through the window. And now alcohol is actually considered as a carcinogen that can increase your cancer risk. So, um, you know, it will be no time before, um, you know, medical industry doctors or, you know, healthcare providers can start recommending to, you know, limit or quit alcohol, which already we do for, you know, smoking before you go under certain surgeries for cancer, people need to be, you know, clear of smoking before they can take them into surgery. So coming back again, a diet that can be rich in fruits, vegetable, whole grains, limiting alcohol, and, um, you know, smoking and other carcinogens can be greatly beneficial, which is nothing but a yogic diet. Coming to pranamaya kosha. So in the case of pranamaya kosha, we see the imbalances, ati jirna, ajirna, and kujirna. So this is looked in Ayurveda and other traditional systems of medicine. So it is, you know, translated as over digestion, under digestion, or, uh, you know, wrong digestion. So we also see this not only in food, but also with the information and stress. So sometimes we tend to over digest, you know, the information that we are getting, or sometimes it is too under digested. We don't take it in the right spirit or wrong digestion also. So in Pranamaya Kosha, these prolonged habits can localize as imbalances at the body level that can again enhance cancer risk. Pranic deficiency needs to be addressed as well. So pranayama for balance and repair. Again, there, are, there can be certain pranayama practices that can be limited in certain stages of cancer, but there are a lot of pranayama practices that can be used to enhance balance and repair in cancer patients. Again, techniques, many not limited to, but mudras, circulation of prana for enhancing the pranic um, you know, activity throughout the body, deep rest, also reduces unwanted, you know, um, pranic depletion and pranic energization technique, another great, you know, uh, practice that is practiced at Svyasa are all some of the techniques that are um, helpful at the pranamaya kosha level. Manomaya kosha, again, you have heard about some of these. Stress management is an important role, but again, stress management can have a huge spectrum. Managing stress or anxiety from the moment to actually developing a um, developing a resilience where you don't have to be stressed, right? So if everything there is a stressor outside and I get stressed every time and I do some pranayama to manage my stress, that is one level. But can I actually make myself immune to not getting stressed? This is what basically yoga teaches through the samatvam, you know, sukha dukkha. Uh, Krishna talks about in Bhagavad Gita, either it is, you know, extreme happiness or extreme, you know, despair. Can you stay in the state of balance? This is something, you know, um, that happens when you take yoga as a sadhana, not just yoga as a practice on mat for an hour, but when you go yoga off the mat and really try to find that balance or samatva through all the different activities that you do. Coming to cancer treatment, I'm watching for time. Uh, there, when we talk about cancer treatment, it is no more traditionally just chemotherapy, radiation, or surgery. Now, cancer therapy options are many. It can be immunotherapy, hormone therapy, uh, different kinds of transplantations, and um, um, active, um, you know, uh, targeted therapies that are there for cancer management. So, when you look at you know cancer journey, 
So it is not just, oh, I'm diagnosed with cancer. Let me do some yoga. A lot of cancer patients also say, I'm so stressed. I will do yoga after my cancer treatment. But honestly, yoga has the potential to be intervened throughout the cancer journey. It can be a diagnosis. It can be during treatment. And even in treatment, there are so many phases before surgery, after surgery, before chemotherapy, after chemotherapy, during chemotherapy. And then we get into the survivorship you know, period. The moment a person is diagnosed with cancer, you are considered as a cancer survivor. So it is not even that survivorship is only after you complete treatment. The moment you are diagnosed, every day, every minute that you live is basically your survivorship. And then the scope of yoga, even in end of life, when patients are living with terminal illness and they are you know, getting close to uh, their uh, death time, can you help patients to find comfort during even at that time, if you can? And throughout this cancer treatment, what we continuously see is decreased quality of life and the trauma of the treatment itself. So what has helped in the cancer um, treatment and role is some of the, the uh, enormous amount of research in the field. We see that um, cancer research, especially in terms of yoga and cancer, you know, in the last 10 to 20 years, thanks to a lot of leaders in the field, including substantial work from, you know, Svyasa, work from MD Anderson, work from many other institutes around the globe, has really come to put together a lot of uh, data in the field, a lot of literature and understanding in the field. So in 2018, uh, ASCO, um, uh, you know, came across the um, special endorsement for SIO, which is Society of Integrative Oncology. I see one of our colleagues from SIO joining our uh, meeting uh, a few minutes ago, which is doing a great amount of work in bringing integrative, you know, oncology practices where yoga was endorsed as a, a great source for you know, stress management, stress reduction, anxiety, yoga for depression and mood, and yoga and meditation for improving quality of life, especially in breast cancer population, because we see a lot of literature in breast cancer. And then coming to some um, clinical guidelines from National Comprehensive Cancer Care Network, this is a place where a lot of integrative you know, modalities are looked at and the literature in each field is looked at to see what kind of um, you know, treatments can be helpful in these areas. And yoga is looked at, recommended as a category one treatment for cancer-related fatigue. Coming to antimesis, nausea and vomiting, yoga again is recommended you know, uh, if it is approved from the patient. And distress management, you know, relaxation therapies like meditation, um, all these are recommended in cancer population. Another challenge with the yoga research literature is when we look at yoga therapy, we include yoga, meditation, asana, pranayama, uh, relaxation techniques, mudras, you know, sounds, uh, nada yoga, and all these things. But in research, it is so much split. So a lot of time, relaxation, um, guided imagery, or other kind of forms of meditation are all researched separately, and the recommendations can you know, come back separately as well. So there are more to National Comprehensive Cancer Network's recommendation to yoga as a mind-body practice under the bigger umbrella. And during the treatment, we see a lot of you know, symptoms, shortness of breath, headache, pain, nausea, constipation, sleep disturbances, and social burden of cancer for family and caregivers as well. So during treatment, um, there can be a lot done before patient begins treatment. So if somebody is diagnosed with cancer, they can actually begin yoga therapy right away under the guidance of an expert practitioner. So we continuously you know, help at various levels, not just at the physical level and the symptom management, but continuing to cope healthily and listen and honor the body one of the biggest challenges for cancer patients, especially if they were healthy and active before the treatment is, I could do so much, but I cannot do. I'm so tired and which can cause frustrations. So yoga really helps you to listen, accept, sublimate, and move forward as you go through the treatment, which becomes again very important. Sankalpa, which is one of the biggest, biggest 
Uh, strengths for cancer patients going through cancer can be extremely useful as well. Um, trauma of cancer, I thought this will be interesting and important that the role of mind continues you know, to play a huge role. There is data now, ACEs, which, is, which we call as adverse childhood experiences. Children growing up in difficulty or extreme stressful situations or children being abused in childhood actually increases the risk of cancer in adulthood by many, many, many folds. So it's important that we continue to create that healthy environment, a yogic environment and lifestyle from the childhood for children itself. And if people have trauma or PTSD before cancer, you also see that you know, amplifies during cancer and treatment. So you know, in whole, patients may have survived the disease, but may not be the experience. Going through the treatment itself is extremely traumatic. So introducing yoga can again be a great addition in this area. Um, I understand that a lot of you are therapists, doctors in the field. So as much as yoga is now recommended as you know, a great thing to start during you know, treatment, something very, very important to understand is there is really a compromised situation in cancer patients. So we may not know the fitness of the cancer patient. Um, you know, with cancer treatment, a lot of cancer treatments like chemo radiation suppresses the body's immunity. So blood counts, or if the patient has metastasis in the bone during doing advanced yoga postures, there are incidences and case reports that where you know people are tried to do advanced yoga practices in cancer patients, and because of the bone fragility and osteoporosis, have ended up in fractures in cancer patients, which you know is life changing. Is is it really puts their um, puts them at a higher risk for these. So it's really important that you know both patients and therapists are aware of these. So if you are a yoga therapist, please be particularly mindful of the risk that comes with cancer population. If you're not familiar with what happens with cancer and the changes of the body in the cancer patients, please do not try to introduce yoga postures or advanced practices. Simple pranayama practices would be good. Again, Kapalabhati can be contraindicated in many you know, situations. So really keep in mind some of the safety precautions um, um, which is very, very important in the interest of time. I'll quickly uh, come to what we do at uh, MD Anderson. I just have a couple minutes left. So at MD Anderson, uh, when we talk about yoga in cancer care, you know, it's an excellent uh, adjuvant therapy to be added on to cancer patients. Quite cost-effective when you compare to many other treatments or therapies. Um, it's important that yoga is, you know, introduced in the bigger true spirit rather than just the postures. And coming to integrating yoga into healthcare at MD Anderson, patients have individual yoga meditation consoles. So these are done under the guidance of a yoga therapist. Doctors just refer them and a you know, well-experienced yoga therapist in cancer care can provide patients with inpatient, outpatient, you know, one-on-one -on -one consoles, group yoga therapy sessions, uh, which are all found to be very helpful in symptom you know, management and providing support to the patients. All the services are available virtually right now. And these are some of the group outpatient programs that we offer. Again, you can see that um, a one-on-one -on -one yoga meditation, yoga therapy consult, and some of the group classes that we offer is also given there. So when we talk about the bigger picture of cancer prevention, uh, what really needs to happen is a community action. So a lot of policies from the public health at the government, state government levels need to happen as well. But what is under our control is adopting yoga as a way of life, not just yoga for a few minutes on the mat, which is a great place to start at, but really adopting yoga as a bigger way of life is what is really, really important. Uh, along with, you know, regular screening, which is known to help in, you know, um, cancer prevention, especially in can preventing cancer deaths. Education on lifestyle factors need to com continuously happen at various levels and increasing access to, you know, affordable, nutritious foods, which is a challenge around the globe for developing countries 
and opportunities for physical activity regularly needs to be you know, accomplished as well. There can be a lot of barriers, you know, which also need to be overcome, but uh, keeping in mind that you know, cancer prevention is individual as well as a bigger community activity. I would like to acknowledge um, you know, support from MD Anderson team, my mentors and others, and the enormous work of uh, Esvyasa and my gurus from uh, Esvyasa Yoga University as well. So good health is the best wealth. Let us all continue to join forces to improve health and looking at health as wealth, actually not losing health uh, for the sake of wealth. These are some of the references that I used in my um, talk. I'll stop share. I'm sorry for going over a couple minutes, but if we have time, uh, Sahana, I would be happy to maybe take any questions. Yes, Thank moving you. on to the questions. Mm -hmm. Now, <laughs> there's already a question. Um, okay, I'll just read it after you. Uh, is it suggested or recommended that a cancer patient undergoing chemotherapy may undertake fasting? Um, again, that is why I made the point that I'm not a, a, a dietitian, neither a doctor, you know, to um, recommend this. So um, what I meant by really putting that point is there is potential. Depending on what kind of treatment you're going through, and this differs from patient to patient, if you are a patient who is extremely malnourished, fasting may not be the thing for you, you know, um, during any part of treatment, actually. But as a preventative practice, if you want to, you know, um, there are a lot of religious practices to fasting as well, fasting on Sankasta, Ekadashi, or fasting on Ramadan for, uh, you know, our um, Muslim friends. So there are a lot of uh, aspects to fasting that is there. So it can be adopted as a preventative thing, but it really depends from patient to patient. And you need to work with an expert um, and let your medical care team know that if it is, um, you know, appropriate for you to begin, but there is potential literature suggests that. Any questions? Thank you. I see some comments. Thank you very much. Uh, A lot of people like thanking you. Uh, there's one question. Why can't the medical fraternity influence the government to label food causing cancer? Difficult to change culture without support of government. Exactly. And again, I think if governments have to do, there needs to be a lot of root level work that needs to be done. So, you know, people in cancer care can come together, influence their local leaders. So this can be your MLAs, MPs in countries like India, congressmen in countries like US, where this really needs to be spoken and brought to their attention so they can take to the higher levels of government. Uh, because uh, let's not forget that this entire food giants invest millions and billions in advertising and they lobby a lot in governments across the world, you know, to really get into their, you know, systems to be able to market and make money. This is by the end of the day for corporation making money. So awareness is something that we can work with and then joining hands to change the culture is the step that we all can slowly come together and work together. If we can make a choice that we will eat healthy, you know, nobody can actually push food down our throat. So it is really a lot of self-awareness and education too. But definitely if we pick up the momentum, I think we can change, you know, the government or the other authorized bodies that can help giving us better guidelines. Any, uh, any more questions? Thank you, Lakulish and CCYRN for this great opportunity to share. Uh, have a good rest of your day and good evening and good night for the friends around the world. Uh, thank you, Sana. Uh, Lakuli Shoga University expresses deep gratitude to Mrs. Smita for having accepted our invite and for spending time with us to enlighten us all about role of yoga in cancer care, prevention and management. Between the hectic schedule at the OPD and Cancer Institute, being the program director at SVSA USA branch, it's really early there, especially now, 
and you've been very kind to share your knowledge with us. Your session was immensely helpful to all of us since most of us attending today are from field of yoga or into cancer management. It was indeed very insightful. We thank you once again for your time. Thank you, pleasure is mine. We thank all the participants for being with us today. Participants from Greece, Indonesia, Philippines, China, Vietnam, South Africa, US, UK, and many other countries have joined us today and parts of India. I would like to thank Dr. Dinesh Bhai Aminji, Chancellor of Lakuli Shoga University for giving us this opportunity and constantly encouraging us to do better. I thank Dr. Chandrasinji Jalaji, Provost of Lakuli Shoga University, Sri Rahil Bhai Patelji, Sri Harishchandra Ranaji, Dr. Arunabha Jadeja, Dr. Vivek Maheshwari, and all members of Board of Management and Governing Body who have, who have always supported and encouraged us. Special thanks to our registrar, Sri Oti Davesa, who has helped us always in organizing webinars and always been a constant support of strength. I thank the staff of LOAU for attending this webinar. I would also like to thank Yashwara, student of BAC 6th semester, Thresha, Kritika, Vidhi, Kilna of MSc 4th semester, who have helped us in technical arrangements and have been patient with us. We in Lakuli Yoga University take pride in students who are multi-talented and encourage them in the path of holistic growth. With this, I end today's program. Sarve Bhavantu Sukhinaha, Loka Samastha Sukhino Bhavantu. Om Shanti Shanti Shanti. Thank you all. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. The e-certificates will be mailed to you within a week. Thank you.